Good morning, everyone. We're so glad that you're here this morning. We'd like to invite you to find a seat and stand with us for worship.
consumes like fire. But other power can raise the dead. What other name remains undefeated? Only a holy Good to see everybody on this Father's Day. Um, hey, just a couple of things. Uh, we didn't have our guy uh, this week make our, our 
prophecy update video, so I thought I would give you a few updates on what's happening in the world. Um, first of all, I wanted to point out, have you noticed that Gavin Newsom has lifted the mask mandate, but yet people are still wearing masks? Um, what's the problem with that? Have you also noticed that the stores still require you to wear masks and restaurants are still requiring you to wear masks, even though the governor has rescinded his order? Why is that? And I want you to see something. That is called social conditioning. People will even admit that they're going to continue to wear a mask because it is like a pacifier for them. And uh, guys, this is a stair step to more conditioning that's coming. Second thing I want to note, I want you to note, uh, someone was telling me this morning their kids went to Magic Mountain, okay? And Magic Mountain's not taking cash anymore. It's, it's, it's all either debit or, you know, credit card or whatever. They're not accepting cash anymore. And I'm starting to notice that there's more and more businesses that are starting to eliminate cash. Now, why, why is that important? Because the Bible predicts a cashless, cashless digital currency, basically, which, which is coming um, and we're moving quickly to that. When you start seeing amusement parks and other businesses saying we're not accepting cash anymore, you're on a fast track. We already know what they want to do on the digital currency. And what does that do? It gives them more control and it ultimately leads into knowing you're buying and selling which I think I heard that phrase somewhere in a book I read somewhere, um, where you won't be able to buy or sell. But again, we won't be, in, we won't be here for that, but uh, that'll be in the tribulation. But what we're seeing is the setup of it. The, the shadow is being cast from the tribulation onto us, and we're starting to see how we get there. And, and thank God we'll be removed before the time comes, but you're seeing the setup, man. It's happening. So I wanted to point those couple things out. Since it's Father's Day, I thought I would stop in my uh, Ten Commandments uh, series and do a Father's Day message. Um, and I thought I would focus in on one of the greatest fathers um, is Father Abraham, the father of faith. And we're going to look at a, a famous story. You probably know it very well uh, with the call of God on his life to sacrifice his own son. And we're going to dig into not only the typology of Isaac and Abraham with the father and the son, but we're also going to understand the requirements for becoming a friend of God. So I'm going to speak to the guys today about how to become a friend of God, but it also is applicable to you ladies as well, because any believer can become a friend of God, but not, but not every believer is a friend of God. A friend of God comes later on in Abraham's life when he goes through this test, and then he's designated friend of God only after passing the test. James will remark on this, and in James it's, uh, chapter 2 it says this, um, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? And he was called the friend of God. And so you'll see that phrase, and it means that after this event, he was designated with that. Now, this designation comes to those who mature so much in their faith that they're able to pass a test like this. And this test is more than what we could even bear to think about. The test is to give up something that is irreplaceable. To give up that which you love so much if God asks you for it. To let him have it. And it's the ultimate in tests. Now, Abraham has went through a lot of tests in his life. This is not the one and only test. It is the ultimate test that has been building up to this point in time. Abraham has, has went through a lot of tests. The first test was to leave your country. He did. He passed at that. He left his home to follow God to a new home. That's the test. Another test is a test of war. Would Abraham fight for that which is right? And he did. Then he, 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 he passed the test of becoming worldly because in the separation with Lot, 
Lot chose to become worldly and go to the well-watered plains of Sodom. And Abraham decided to stay in the tents. He was separate from the world. He had to separate from his own nephew. That was a test. The test of money. Abraham had that test. Even though Abraham was wealthy, he had the test of money. One time the king of Sodom came and was willing to give Abraham the spoils of war if Abraham would give over the people. And Abraham chose the people over wealth. He passed that test. And he passed these tests for the next 50 years, test after test after test, to finally get to this ultimate test. So when God ever gives you this ultimate test, and it will come to you, it's after a series of you passing other tests. But if you don't pass these tests, he won't give it to you. It's only if you pass the other tests before that. The test of money, the test of loyalty, the test of saying the right things and speaking for the truth and things of that nature. And so it's a rare designation. It is available to you. You can have it. But you have to see what is required for it in the text. And once you see it, you will see what it takes. And that's what I want, we want to talk about today. Verse 1 says this, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And the idea, again, the test is, it's not a test for God. God already knows Abraham's heart, understands his faith. He's testing Abraham to show Abraham what's in him what kind of faith he has. And that's what all the tests are for. It's for you and I to see what kind of faith we have. And he said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Now, this is the interesting thing. Again, you're looking at Abraham after passing so many tests and the the maturity that he has when God calls him, he says, I'm available. I'm here. Whatever, Whatever you need. And this is interesting because this is not normally how believers act. This is a sign of maturity that I'm willing to do whatever you call. He's not saying, hey, I'm too busy. I got these things cooking over here. I got several items dealing with, that I'm dealing with. I, I might have to take a rain check on that, Lord. No, no, I'm available. What do you need? At the, at the moment, he's available. Whatever you need, I'll do. That's a sign of maturity. That's what it takes to become a friend of God. Verse two, then he said, take now your son. Notice the threefold identification here. Your son, which son? He has two, Ishmael and Yitzhak. Your only son, Yitzhak, or laughter, one who laughs. Your only son. Now, why would he say that, your only son? Because... He has two sons, but Isaac is a unique son because the Abrahamic promise is not, is not going through just Abraham. It's going to be passed on to Isaac, and Isaac will take the mantle of the Abrahamic covenant, and it will pass through him. This is what makes him uniquely the son of Abraham, whom you love. It's obvious he does love him. It'll wrench his heart for what God is going to ask him. But this is interesting. You see the same phraseology in the Gospels when you, were, when you look at Jesus. In John 3, 16, the most famous passage in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. Now, our King James says, uh, New King James says begotten, but the translation probably is better, one and only unique son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The unique son of God. See, angels are called sons of God. You and I are called sons and daughters of God once we become born again. So the Bible is designating the second person of the Trinity as the unique son of God. He's the eternal son of God. Messiah is the God-man. So, it's, it, so Isaac and Jesus are being compared here. And so from this point on, I'm going to make the typologies back and forth between Isaac and Jesus. Abraham will play the role of the father. Isaac will play the role of the son. And you'll see the parallels and the typologies going back and forth as God provides. So with that being said, let's continue on. And go to the land of Moriah. 
Now, where Abraham's at at this point is uh, basically 50, 60 miles from this place. It's about a three-day journey. And what I want to point out, it says, and it says, go to the land. In, in Hebrew, it's lech lecha. And it's the idea of reminding Abraham of his original call out of the Ur of the Chaldees. This is the same phrase he used when he called him out of the Ur of the Chaldees. Now Abraham is being called to something else. Please understand, in your walk with the Lord, you have a call on your life. You got saved, and now you're called to do a mission with your life. And God will always remind you of that call, just like he's doing to Abraham. Abraham, remember I called you? Now I'm calling you to something else. So, something in your mission is changing. I'm asking you to do something else. And the call stays with you, but it, it changes it turns different ways, different paths, but it's still the call of God. And he's reminding Abraham, remember I called you? I'm calling you now to something ultimate right now. Now, he's talking about Mount Moriah. Now, this is a picture of the topography of Israel. Mount Moriah is Jerusalem, the area in, 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 that encompasses this place. Mount Zion is right there, but you can see the Kidron Valley, the Tyropian Valley, and then the Valley of Hinnom. So, this is where he's calling Abraham to go sacrifice at this location, Isaac. And, and, and again, the topography, if you look at these pictures, um, you can see what it looks like. And you can see the Tyropian Valley, you can see the Kidron Valley, but you can see the peak of Moriah. Moriah is about 3,000 feet elevation. Again, it's not a, the tallest mountain in Israel, but... It is the, a significant, sacred, and holy place. This is what Mount Moriah looked like in, in David's day when he took the uh, city of Jerusalem uh, and probably what it looked like in Solomon's day. This is all that it encompassed, and this is Mount Moriah, and the lower par portion of Mount Moriah is the city of David. Um, but again, you're looking at Mount Moriah. So when you overlay it, um, the... Uh, with the, the old city of Jerusalem today, and then you, 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 you see where the temple would have been, as you can see the temple of Israel, whether it's Solomon or Herod's temple later on, was on top of Mount Moriah. This is the place of sacrifice. This is the holy place where God deems the sacrifice to happen right there on this mountain. Today, it looks like this. Today, um, it's the Temple Mount. And from an aerial view, you can see where the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque is. That is the Temple Mount structure in which Mount Moriah is, is, is there underneath that. Uh, and it's unfortunate today that the, the Islam controls it. And even that Dome of the Rock uh, is the most blasphemous thing uh, written on it says that God has no son across the top of it, but it is in the control of Islam. And unfortunately, it is being desecrated as we speak when you have a no, other than a Jewish entity controlling the Temple Mount. That's a desecration. And so anyway, this is what it looks like today. This is the place of sacrifice. Now, I'll come back to this in just a bit. The, and I'll talk about the significance of Mount Moriah. And offer him there as a burnt offering. So here's the test. Will Abraham obey and sacrifice his own son, the son of promise, to God? And again, the, the test is, will you give God that which you deem irreplaceable? What is irreplaceable in your life? And you're saying this is irreplaceable. What if God asked you, I want that from you? That's the test. Would you be willing to give up that which you think is irreplaceable? Whether it's a bank account, whether it's a, uh, you know, material possessions, whether it's status, whether it's your identity, whether it's whatever, would you be willing to give that up? If you are, then you're well on your way becoming a friend of God. And then he continues on, 
I want to sacrifice this burnt offering to happen on the mountain of which I shall tell you. And again, we know it's Mount Moriah. Now, now let, let me explain this. The Jews, the rabbis, have a contention, and I think it's a good contention. I'm not going to be dogmatic on this, but even in this text, it lends support, and I'll show you in just a bit, support to their theory. And that's why I want to make sure you understand it's a theory, but I think it's a good theory. The belief from the Old Testament in deduction, in bringing different pieces of, of the puzzle together, the deduction, the Jewish deduction, is that Mount Moriah is the place where Adam and Eve were created. That Adam and Eve were created out of the dust of the ground in this very location. And that this was the original garden temple in which Adam and Eve were there. Now, as you know, Satan entered this garden and tempted uh, Eve and Adam, and they fell. And so then they were kicked out of the, of the garden temple. They still were in the vicinity, but they would go to this area, the place of sacrifice, to do burnt offerings to Yahweh. And we have a clue in chapter 4 of Genesis. This is exactly what was happening with Abel and Cain. You remember that? They were making their sacrifices to Yahweh. This would be the place where you would do the sacrifice on that particular altar. And again, it's deduction. I think it's a good deduction because based on the future and the history of this location. Now follow me on this. If this is the place where Adam and Eve uh, was created, if this is where the altar was uh, and the cherubim guarded the entrance to the garden, which was Mount Moriah, the garden temple, this would make sense in the fact that this is where God led Israel to put their first temple, right? Not the tabernacle, but the temple would be on Mount Moriah under Solomon, right? The threshing floor is on top of Mount Moriah that David bought. And they put the temple, and this would be where the altar is for sacrifice, for burnt offerings. Furthermore, it continued to be that way through Jesus' day. And then we know this, that in the future, Jesus will rebuild a millennial temple and put it right there on Mount Moriah, and he will rule and reign from Mount Moriah as the second Adam. And I want you to think about this. As the first Adam failed, the second Adam, the first Adam was our king. Our king failed. But our new king, the Messiah, will not fail and will rule and reign where Adam and Eve were supposed to rule and reign. And that's what we call the millennium or the messianic age. All in this location. And folks, tell me where Messiah was crucified. He was crucified on Mount Moriah just north. The highest point, if you go where it says the Mount Moriah, if you go just northward, there's a higher peak right there. You can see the little cut out there. That's where Golgotha is. This is where Messiah was sacrificed on the height of Moriah, the place of sacrifice. Doesn't it make sense that where man fell, man would be redeemed in the place in which he fell? Totally makes sense. God always brings back everything to the beginning. He destroys evil in Babylon. That's where evil started. And, and so it's, it's that, that sense that I want you to understand. Again, uh, it, it's, it's speculation, but it's a good deduction, I think. But anyway, verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning. The idea there is he didn't, think of, he didn't have to think about it. He already made a decision. So he gets up early in the morning. God doesn't have to explain anything to him. He just gets up, and what does he do? Saddles his donkey uh, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Now, why is this significant? Why is, why is Moses giving all these details? Because it shows you that he is a man of obedience about little things. 
In order to do a big thing, a big obedience, you have to be faithful in a few things. You have to be obedient in little things. Don't discount little things of obedience because those things build up to big obedience. If you're faithful in a few things, I will put you in charge of many things is the principle. That's what uh, uh, Abraham is demonstrating, that he can be faithful in the little things that you give him as an assignment, and he will do that. Interesting enough that Messiah points this out in John chapter 15. He says this, You are my friends. There's a designation, friend. You are my friends if, there's a conditional, you do whatever I command you. You see the designation? He told the disciples, if you want to be like Abraham, then do what I tell you to do. How do you show your love for the Messiah? Obey him. So that designation of friend comes from obedience. So he's doing that. You're seeing it, evidence right now. Verse 4, then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now what I want you to note is this is the first time he will lift up his eyes to see the place of sacrifice, to see Jerusalem. He will see it. And again, it's 3,000 feet elevation, so he would have been looking up. Understand in the Hebrew uh, context that lifting your eyes up is a way of saying faith. He did lift up his eyes literally, but it's by faith that he lifted his eyes up. Now, he'll do it twice in the text, and I want to connect it uh, to the future in just a bit. But pay particular attention of lifting your eyes to the place of sacrifice. Moses asked Israel when they were being bitten by serpents, to look up, lift up your eyes towards and see the bronze serpent on the pole. Look up, lift up. Again, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's, it's the idea of faith, faith to a place far off. Now, it's a three-day journey. Notice it says the third day Abraham saw it. It took him three days to get there. Why is that significant? Three-day motive, a three-day motive. Well, wait a second. Messiah told Israel that the sign of Jonah is a three-day motive. I, I will, no other sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah, whereas Jonah was three days in the belly of, of a fish, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days. When you see the three-day motif, it refers to resurrection, and particularly the Messiah's resurrection. So it took them three days to get there. It's already setting the stage that somebody's going to have a resurrection. There's a theme of a resurrection. And so we'll talk about that when we get there. It's, it won't be a physical resurrection. It'll be a figurative resurrection. Verse 5, and Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and lad, and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Wait a second, you already know, Abraham knows he's going to go sacrifice his son, but his soul, he's so confident. He said, we're, we're both going to come back to you. Where did he get this confidence at? Again, this is a mark of a friend of God. The friend of God trusts in the word of God. And God had made a promise to Abraham that through Isaac, the Abrahamic covenant would pass. And so in Abraham's mind, he's using his faith to think through this. People of faith think correctly. People who don't have faith get distorted versions of reality. They don't think correctly. So we get a glimpse from the writer of Hebrews of what Abraham's thinking was like, and it comes from his faith. So uh, let me read this real quick for you. This is Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who received the promises offered his only begotten son. Notice what he did. He received the promises. It's the idea, I trusted the promises, Abraham's saying. Of whom it was said, here's the promise. In Isaac, your seed shall be called. 
So what did he think? By trusting in the promises, notice where it led his thinking, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. You see the thinking? It's the idea of this. Well, God has said that my son is the promised one, but yet he's asking me to sacrifice my son. So how are we going to do this? So the mind of faith says, well, God is going to make true on his word, so he must have the ability and will resurrect my son after we slay him. And so the idea is this is how the mind of faith works. It doesn't ask for an explanation. It just hangs on the promise. And that promise leads you to the right conclusion most times. Now think about this on a practical level. You and I get into situations where we're tested, and in the test, you are confused. I'm confused. I don't know which way is up, which way is down. I don't know the next move. I don't know the right move. But I can trust in the promises of God when he says, all things work together for the good, and there's a caveat, there's two caveats, to those who love God. So the believer has to love God. How do you know you love God? You obey God. That's the caveat. And to those who are called according to his purpose, who are actually following their call on, his, on their lives that God put on. So the idea is, even if you're confused, and even if there's a, a, a hurricane swirling around you, and you don't know, you can't make sense out of it, you can trust the promises that if you obey, and if you answer the call on your life, then those things will work out for the good eventually. And so, that, so even though we don't have a specific promise, like it's Isaac, we have that promise. And that's what you have to hang your hat on when you don't know what's going on, when it's crazy and, and, and darkness is around you and you, you don't know which way is up. You have to trust on those promises and that makes a person a friend of God if they can do things like that. So that's what he's concluding. And let's continue on verse 6. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. Now, in, I have some pictures and I want to show you just kind of a, to get a glimpse of, of these artist renditions. They have to ascend up Mount Moriah, okay? You always have to ascend up. And, and notice that Isaac is carrying wood. Now, again, Isaac is a picture of the Messiah. When did Messiah carry wood on his back? To the cross, to the place of sacrifice, did he not? He carried the wood. So this, I, this picture of Isaac carrying wood on his back is a picture of the patabulum that Messiah would have carried on his back. And, and let me add a, a second element. Carrying the wood shows that Isaac is old enough to bear the weight of the wood. He's a young man, maybe a teenager, maybe tops 25. He's able to carry and bear the weight of the wood. What does that mean? Messiah was able to bear the weight of sin on him, to take our sins upon him and bear that weight and be able to make the sacrifice for you and I for the entire world, right? That's the weight that Messiah bore, that weight of sin. Now, this is interesting. In the movies, have you ever seen these movies, whether it's The Passion or these, any Jesus movie, they'll always have Jesus falling down, like he can't bear the weight. Nowhere in Scripture does it say he fell down. Why do the movies continue to push that he fell down? Well, it comes from Roman Catholicism. He never fell. The point of him not falling is the idea is he can bear the weight. The Messiah is able to be strong enough to bear this weight of sin, pictured by carrying a cross. Now, Simon of Cyrene was brought in, but he still bore the weight. He didn't fall and neither does Isaac. He bears the weight. 
Again, a picture of the Messiah. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two went together. Notice the father and son are cooperating together in this venture. The idea of fire is that it would be a living, uh, sorry, a uh, burnt offering sacrifice. And what you would do with a knife, you would slice the victim's throat, the animal, and, and let the blood bleed out, and they would physically extinguish its life. And then you would burn the whole animal. So that's called a burnt offering. And it was a whole, whole offering of the whole entire animal. Well, this is what Abraham has in his hand. Okay, so how does that prefigure then the Messiah? The fire and the knife. Well, when did fire appear on the cross? Well, again, fire is a picture of judgment. So on the cross, Messiah experiences the fire of God's wrath on the cross. This is, when you look at the cross, from 9 to 12, he experiences the wrath of man. From 12 to 3, he experiences the wrath of God. This is why the whole scene went dark. This is why at the beginning of when the wrath was poured out on him, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting Psalm 22. And then for three hours, he experiences the fire of judgment, so to speak, figuratively, of God. God on him for our sins. And then when the atonement has been made, the first thing out of Messiah's mouth, he says what? I thirst. He went through the fire of judgment, and the first thing he says, I'm thirsty, because he experienced that fire. And then the knife comes in, when Messiah gives up his life, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit, and Messiah gives up his life and physically dies, and the proof, the proof that Messiah was dead was what? What did the Romans do to him after? They stuck a spear through his side, a knife on the end of a stick, and pulled it out, and the pericardian sac was busted as, it, as the pericardian fluid came out and the blood came out in that mixture that John reports, which means that that spear pierced all the way into his heart. And that was the proof, the knife proof, that Messiah was dead, and he had to die because he's the sacrifice. There's the knife and the fire. Verse 7, but Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Isaac doesn't know. Where is the lamb? Remember this question, okay? Where is the lamb? Remember that. But that, make a mental note right now. I'm going to come back to that later. And Abraham said, my son. Now, the way to interpret this, my son, is it's not just simply him saying, responding back, my son, as you would in a discourse. He's actually identifying who the sacrifice will be. My son will be the sacrifice. He's telling his boy, you're going to be the sacrifice. Just like God the Father's son would be the sacrifice. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Now this phrase is an important phrase. God will provide for himself. This is the idea that Abraham has said, look, I have done all that I need to do as far as obedience is concerned. The rest is up to God. And, and this is the, the heart of the matter. You have to know where the division of labor is. You have to do your part in the call of God, in your mission work that he has for you. You do all that you can, but here's, here's what you're going to find out. You're going to come to the end of yourself, and that's fine. When you come to the end of yourself, realize that the rest is his responsibility. We do what we can, and we leave the results to God. 
He gives the results. He gives the provision. He does that. We do our obedience. That's what Abraham's done. I've, I've went to the right place. I brought the right things. Now he's going to have to provide. Ultimately, in salvation, it was God who took the initiative and provided for us. He, took the, he made the provision. You and I can't make a provision for salvation. He had to. It was his responsibility. What's our responsibility? Believe. Believe in my son. I'll do the rest. He will do the work for you. He will keep the law. He will make the sacrifice for you. So what do I do? Believe. That's it. That's your responsibility. Believe and you will have everlasting life. So this passage, this, this section in Scripture is showing you how God deals with us in salvation. He takes that responsibility on, not us. So Abraham, on a human level, I want you to see this, Abraham cannot trust in anything but God to provide. See, he's at it alone. Yes, his son is with him, but there's no family members with him to lend support, to give prayer support, or anything. He's on his own. His own wife doesn't even know that this is happening. The two lads that he brought don't know this is happening. Even Isaac is fuzzy on this at this point. He's alone. And that sometimes is where God needs you to be in order to be a friend of his. Quit relying on the crutches around you. And at some point, it's got to be just you and God. You can't ride someone else's coattails. You can't depend on someone else's faith to get you through it. You will have to be one-on-one -on -one with God, you and him alone, in what the test is. Because that's the only way sometimes. Yes, it is nice to get support, but sometimes that support is a crutch. It's, it's, it's Abraham having no resources, no, no, no human provision to where he now has to trust simply on God making that provision. Man, that is a hard place to be, but it is the place that you have to get to in order to be call, called a friend of God. Anyway, we continue. Verse 9, Then they came to the place of which God had told them. This is Mount Moriah, the place of sacrifice. And Abraham built an altar there. Ah, we have a little clue here. This is what I wanted to show you. Abraham built an altar there, and placed the wood in, in, the, in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Now, the altar is mentioned twice. The second time it's said in, in the Hebrew, it's the altar, but I will say this. The first time it's mentioned the altar, um, your English says an altar on that. So go back to the text real quick. You see how your English says an altar? Well, the way you can actually translate it, it's the same translation as, as the altar down there. So what we start realizing is some commentators, some rabbi commentators don't see an and there as a definite article. They see a the in front of that word, the altar. Now again, if it is the altar, which is, the Hebrew allows for that translation and would allow for perhaps another interpretation, then it's not an altar that Abraham built. It's an existing altar that Abraham found on Mount Moriah, the place of sacrifice. Now, obviously, Abraham has already has an encounter with Melchizedek. So Melchizedek has been doing burnt offerings there, so maybe that's the altar he's using. But some of the commentators will say it stretches beyond that, that this altar perhaps, perhaps is very ancient and is the altar that Adam and Eve used. If that's the case, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, that would be very interesting if this is the original altar, even where Cain and Abel went to, that it's the altar. It's the altar we definitely know Melchizedek was using. But again, it, it, it depends on your translation of the, the definite article in front of the word. Nonetheless, whether he built it or he used an ancient one that has biblical significance, 
Notice what he did to Isaac. He placed the wood in order. You would have to lay that wood out on the altar, on the top, because that's what you would burn. But the wood is placed in a particular pattern, just like the patabulum was put down and put up on the cross beam to form a cross. The wood was put in order. Okay? And then notice what they did to Isaac's hands. Abraham binds his hands. Why is he binding his hands? Well, you would do that from a human standpoint because an animal would have to be bound because he could come off the altar or run off the altar or whatever. You would have to bind the animal's hands. So Abraham binds Isaac's hands. And, and you don't see a fight from Isaac. You don't see him struggling or trying to get away or whatever. Like he's willingly going to be the sacrifice. He's, he's more than willing. So he allows his father to bind him. So from a human level, you would do this. But on a divine level, there's no need for that. Isaac's going to allow himself to be sacrificed. He's more than willing. But what does this have to do with Jesus? Did they bind the Messiah's hands? Yes, they did. After going through the Jewish court and dealing with the kangaroo court that was going on that evening, it says this, immediately in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Abraham binds Isaac, they bind Jesus. They didn't have to bind Jesus, did they? He was a willing sacrifice, but from a human level, they were afraid he was going to escape. In fact, he proved he wasn't willing to escape because on the cross from 9 to 12, humans and demons were taunting him to come down. Get off the cross. Come down and show us who you are. Show us your power. But he stayed bound on that cross for us. He stayed up there. He was a willing sacrifice. Amazing, isn't it? the connections between the two. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And I I saw this picture and I thought, man, this picture grasps the emotion that Abraham must have had. Can you put yourself in Abraham's shoes and, and, and you're about ready to slice the neck of your son? Now, you know, you know, even though you know God will perhaps raise him back from the dead, you still have to go through the process of killing your own son. That is such gut-wrenching levels. I can't even even imagine myself thinking like that. I can't even imagine going through something like that. But this is the level of maturity that Abraham was at, and even Isaac is showing. This is why the Jews say this is the greatest example of faith in the Bible, is when Abraham was called to do this. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So the the double name of Abraham is to stop him. He's about ready to do this. And because he's about ready to do this, it is as good as if he did it. That's how close he got to doing it. I don't know if he was an inch away or what, but he was ready to slice his own son's neck and it stopped him. And Abraham says, here I am. Again, the same phrase, I'm available, what do you need me to do? That's the heart of Abraham. That's the heart of someone who believes God, and because, that's the heart of a friend of God. Verse 12, and he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. Now again, it's not that God doesn't know this. He's omniscient, so he does know it. It's again to prove Abraham's faith to show Abraham through this experience that he's at this level of faith now that can be called a friend of God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only unique son, right, from me. So Abraham's son escapes, but God's son doesn't. God will provide his son, but he will not allow his own son to escape. That's the difference between Isaac and the Messiah. Verse 13 
Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Now, notice this is the second time where Abraham lifted his eyes. Did you see that? Remember I told you the first time? The first time Abraham lifts his eyes, he sees Mount Moriah, the place of sacrifice. This is the second time in which Abraham lifts his eyes and sees the actual sacrifice of the ram. Two times. Why is that significant? How does that relate to Jesus? Because Jesus says this. This is John chapter 3 and John chapter 12. Twice. John chapter 3 says this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The Son of Man has to be suspended in midair between heaven and earth to be Jacob's ladder. He is suspended midair. He doesn't touch the earth, and nor is he in heaven, but he's suspended between the two as the ladder between God and man. But you, in order to see Messiah, you don't look on the ground. You look up to the place of sacrifice in which he's suspended between heaven and earth. You have to look up. And the, uh, again, the Hebrew idea of looking up is believe. Believe in the Messiah. Look up. It's the Messiah. The place of sacrifice has to be looked up to. It's on a high ground as Jacob's ladder. And then he says this in John 12, and if I am lifted up from the earth... I will draw all people to myself. He only says it twice. How many times did Abraham look up? Twice. How many times the Messiah says, when I'm lifted up? Twice. How's that possible? It's supernatural. It tells you who's writing the story. It's not just simply Moses. It's the Holy Spirit writing through Moses, connecting dots to the future, showing everybody this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. But notice that it's a ram caught in a thicket of by, by, its, thorn, by, by its horns. Um, the horns of a ram are its power. So in the Old Testament, they would make horns of the altar. There would be horns on the altar. It's always a symbol of power. But this ram's power, where its power is centered, is stuck, is bound in the wood. How does that prefigure Christ? Well, Christ has come in the first coming in meekness. You know what meekness means? It means power under control. It means to have a bridle in a horse's mouth and control the, the powerful animal of the horse with the bridle. That Messiah is the eternal God, but his power is under control. What do you mean? Well, remember when they arrested him, he said, look, don't you know I could have 12 legions here to rescue me out of this? I could extend my power and wipe everyone out, basically. Or even on the cross, he withheld his power because they taunted him to come down and show us your power. If you are God, if you are the Messiah, come down. He withheld doing that. Why? He had to restrain his power and not come down off that cross. He had to restrain his power to allow himself to be arrested. It was meekness, power under control, symbolized by the ram's horn, which are the ram's power, being withheld in the thorn bush. It's, 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 it, it can't move. It won't move. It's stuck there. Its power has been restrained by the bush, by the wood, by the cross. One step further. The ram's horn is in a thicket. What's a thicket? It's a thorny bush. A thorny bush? The ram's head is stuck in a thorn bush. Can't get out. Its head's there. It's not his feet. It's not the tail, any part. It's the head that's stuck in a thorny bush, and it can't move out. Thorns. Thorns and thistles will come from the ground because of you, Adam. Ark of the Covenant is made out of thorns. Acacia wood. Hmm. 
keep going on. Messiah's head is crowned with a crown of what? Thorns. The ram's head is stuck in a bush of thorns, picturing the crown of the Messiah on the cross, the sacrifice of the Messiah. Guys, you can't get better than that. That's Holy Spirit stuff right there. Isn't that amazing? It's a picture of the Messiah. And, and, he, and he continues on and says, And so Abraham went and took the ram, offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. There is the substitutionary atonement found only in the Messiah. God would allow his son to die. He didn't allow Abraham's son to die. It's a substitutionary atonement. Verse 14, and Abraham called the name of the place, Lord, the Lord will provide. This is where we get the word uh, for the, one of God's names is Yahweh Yaira. Now, in the old, the old way of pronouncing God's name, they pronounce it with a J, and there's no J in Hebrew, so they pronounce it Jehovah Jireh, but that's, that's, that's wrong. Uh, there's no J in, it's, uh, in Hebrew. It's Yahweh Yaira. And, the, and we, we typically translate that the Lord provides, but it's, it's, it's more than that. It says, the way you translate this is, the Lord will see to it. The Lord will see to it. And uh, to what? And the answer is, to the provision. He will see to it the provision. The great missionary Hudson Taylor in his house there when he was in China, he had two phrases that he hung over, I think by his door or something like that. It said Ebenezer and Yahweh Yaira. And Ebenezer means how the Lord has helped, and Yahweh Yaira is how the Lord will provide. It was a looking back to the past of how God helped and a looking forward to the future of how God would provide. Ebenezer and Yahweh Yaira for his missionary endeavors. And watch this, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. That became a common phrase after this happened in this area of the world. This is what went around after this. This was the, the, the storytelling, the oral tradition that went around. They would say, in the mount of the Lord, Mount Moriah, it shall be provided. What is the it? What is the it? The provision that God would give. And let's stop right there. What is the it? Remember Isaac asked a question and he said, Father, where is the lamb? Was there a lamb in the story? What, what did God provide? A ram. He provided a ram for the sacrifice, not a lamb. But Isaac is asking this question, where's the lamb? The question is never answered. Because God provided a ram, not a lamb. So the question remained open from the time that Isaac mentioned it, 2,000 years later, the answer is given by John the Baptist. When he says, when he sees the Messiah, he answers Isaac's question, behold, there is the Lamb of God who takes away to the sins of the world. Isaac, there he is 2,000 years later. The question was never answered. Isn't that amazing? But John the Baptist answered it. Wow. Wow. And in that, verse 15, the angel of the Lord, this is Christ, the pre-incarnate Messiah, comes as the angel of the Lord, right? The messenger of the Lord. This is Christ, by the way, speaking to him. Called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord. This is Jesus swearing a divine unilateral oath, and he's basically going to reconfirm the Abrahamic covenant. Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, your unique son, blessing I will bless you. That's the Abrahamic covenant, by the way. And multiplying I will multiply your descendants as a 
the stars of heaven and the sand which is, in the, is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies, referring to Israel's victory ultimately over their enemies, ultimately over the Antichrist's and his army. But notice that your descendants will be like the stars of heaven and the sand which is on the seashore. The heavenly bodies refer to the Gentiles. The sand on the seashore refer to the Jews. Because of Abraham's faith, he, he will produce two types of people. Not only a biological Jew and those Jews who have believed, which is the sand, the arets, the earth, but he will also produce Stars, those are Gentiles who get saved, saved in same, getting saved with the same Jewish God, the Abrahamic God, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob God, and they will, they will be like the stars, and the Jews will be like the sand on the sea. There's the twofold aspect of salvation of Jew and Gentile. Let me ask you this question. Is Abraham a Jew? He's both. He's both Jew and Gentile. He's the father of the Jews, but he was called out of the era of the Chaldees. He's Semitic, but he's still a Gentile. So Abraham occupies both positions as Jew and Gentile, therefore is the father of Gentiles who believe and the father of Jews who believe. That's what a friend of God means. Anyway, it says this, in your seed... It's collective Israel and singular, referring to the Messiah. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So I'm recommitting my covenant to you, reaffirming it, that you're going to produce a nation that's going to bless the nations. And then through that nation, an individual seed will come, the Messiah, who will bless the entire world and part of the Abrahamic blessing aspect through salvation. The Messiah is that seed that came through that line. Notice that Messiah was seen in Isaac, in the birth, of Messiah, uh, uh, the birth of Isaac. It was a miraculous birth, wasn't it? Jesus was born a virgin, a miraculous birth. His sacrifice pictures Jesus. And something else he pictures right now that I'm going to tell you. Look at this last verse. You ready for this? You ready for your socks to come off? It's going to come off, right your feet, off your feet, man. This, when you read this, it blows me away every time I see it. Let's read it. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. You think, I don't get it. What's the big deal? It's, it seems anticlimactic. It seems like, okay, that's like the end of my reading. I'm ready to go on. And it, it was just like some incidental facts were thrown in. Of course they went back to their home. No, no, no. You're missing something. Sometimes when you read scripture, look what's not stated. Where is Yitzhak? Where is Isaac? Him and Abraham went, went up, but Isaac doesn't come down. Abraham comes down. The two men come down. That's what it says, but it doesn't mention Isaac. Now, we assume he came down, but it doesn't mention him. Why? Why would it not mention him? This is the most significant thing in Isaac's life, and it doesn't even mention him coming down. In fact, for the next two chapters in Genesis, you will not find Isaac. He's missing. He's mysteriously gone. He's veiled. You can't see him. He's hidden for two chapters. When you read chapter 24 you will know why he was veiled. Why doesn't talk about him right now? The next time you see Isaac's appearance, he's fetching his bride. Did you catch it? Yes. It can't be that good. It's that detailed? Wait a second. So Isaac has a, a, a figurative death, burial, and resurrection. He was saved. Obviously, he had a figurative resurrection. He disappears, and the next time we see, he's going to get a bride. He's fetching a bride. So Jesus, in the first coming, 
dies, is buried, resurrects, then ascends back, and we don't see Jesus right now. He's in heaven. We don't see him face to face. But the next time we see Jesus, the church, he's calling us home, fetching his bride, the church. Oh, my goodness. Is that crazy? That's supernatural. You could, you could not have even written that on your own. No human being could have done that. Notice the intricacies of the Holy Spirit putting all this in, weaving that into the story to prepare you and I for the Messiah. And the rapture is included in it. The rapture, the fetching of the bride is included in the story. The first coming, oh my goodness, wow. I told you your socks would come off. So you got that aspect, but here's the other aspect. the the practical aspect of this. Abraham at this point is called the friend of God. Now that designation you might think, well, what's the big deal about that? The reward of being called the friend of God is that you are justified before men, according to James. Now you're justified before God by faith alone, but you're justified by men by your works. That's not talking about salvation. It's talking about that people, when you're a friend of God, people will see your works, your good works, your testimony, and say, based on what you do with your life, that is a friend of God. Everybody today in this modern world recognizes Father Abraham. Even outside of Christianity, he is recognized as the father of faith. In Judaism, he's the most revered, him and Moses. Islam reveres him. Other religions revere him. They all see him as a man of faith, regardless of the religion. Why? Because everyone recognizes the friendship that he had with God. In fact, think about this, guys. When Trump did a peace plan with the Jews and the Arabs, what did they call it? The Abrahamic Accords. Why would they do that? Because everybody, even in the 21st century, knows that Abraham was a friend of God. And that is not contested. No one contests that. That is the reward of earning, and not salvation, but earning the moniker of friend of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this story The demands we saw that you put on Abraham, he answered that test because of his faith. Help us to be like that. Help us to move in that direction. We may not be there yet, but we're on the progress of getting there. Help us to continue to mature, to continue to trust and obey and do the things necessary to pass the test that you put in front of us. And I also pray, Father, if there's anyone here that hasn't put their faith in the Messiah, They would realize that he died on that cross for their sins, bore their sin, bore their judgment, was buried, rose on the third day, and offers everlasting life to simply anyone who will believe. God not sparing his son because he provided salvation for you and I. I pray for those people to come to faith. In Jesus' name, amen.